pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Laura Lopez. Uh, she is simultaneously a NASA Einstein Fellow and a Papalardo Fellow at MIT. Uh, she's taken all the fel all fellowships all at once. Um, she earned her PhD um, recently in 2011 from UC Santa Cruz, uh, where while she was a graduate student, she also earned the UC President's Dissertation Fellowship, the AAUW, American Association of University Women Fellowship, the Cultural Robles Fellowship, and an NS Graduate Fellowship. So she was swimming in money. Um, <laughs> she was previously at uh, MIT, where she earned her bachelor's in science and physics. She also had minors in astronomy and political science, which I thought was very interesting. Uh, and while she was there, she kept winning more prizes. I guess this was back in time, since that was the first one. But she won the, the Bartlett Prize, which is the best thesis in, in astrophysics. And she also won the Orloff Prize, which is a, a award they give to uh, students who do unusual levels of service. And I'll talk about that in just a second. She's also gotten lots of other awards and prizes, like the APS Young Star Award, the AAS Beth Brown Prize. She's, she's prized, I would say. Um, uh, Dr. Lopez studies uh, the, the whole breadth of star formation, uh, formation, evolution, and demise. Um, she uses observations across the electromagnetic spectrum, from infrared out to X-ray, uh, and also radio, to, and works very closely, importantly, to, with theorists uh, to test the models. I think that's actually a particular strength of Dr. Lopez. She really works with the theorists, and also I think gets their observing time because they don't apply for observing true, time. That's true. That's true. Secret, <laughs> but not secret anymore. Yeah. yeah. yeah it's been broadcast now. <laughs> Um, so her work includes investigations of star formation, in particular star feedback, and how stars form and how clusters form. Uh, she looks at the life cycles of giant molecular clouds. This is now moving into the galactic perspective. And she also looks how feedback, stellar feedback, shapes not just <coughs> the clusters, but also galactic winds and even the galaxies themselves. And then from the sort of the other end of the stellar life cycle, she studies supernova in great detail. Uh, she uses morphological, spectral, and environmental studies to understand what the genders are. She searches for the survivors of the supernovae. And she also looks at particle acceleration in her X-ray uh, X-ray observational work. Um, and that would be fantastic for anyone. However, I also want to point out that uh, Dr. Lopez is, is a remarkable leader in our community from the perspective of, of service. Uh, I would say she has single-handedly made prominent, lasting, positive impacts on the climate of astronomy for for women, for minorities, for the LGBT community, in fact, for everybody, uh, because the kind of work she does actually helps the entire community uh, function, I think, better. Um, she started this as an undergraduate, where she began the Undergraduate Women in Physics program, which is still very active today. Um, when she was at UC Santa Cruz, she organized she organized the faculty. She organized the faculty. Enough said. <laughs> to present career talks for the graduates, of which she was one. Um, she was also a member of the admissions committee, and she investigated biases in the GRE scores. And as a result of her research, uh, the UC Santa Cruz has started to apply a calibration, essentially. If they're all instrumentalists, you apply calibrations when your detector is not exactly uniform. Uh, they call that the Lopez correction at Santa Cruz. Uh, and many other <laughs> institutions, including Caltech and Harvard and several other ones, have now adopted <coughs> similar uh, sort of calibration effects for, for scores. And so she's a, a major leader in that aspect. Um, she's been a long-standing member of the American uh, Astronomical Society's <coughs> Committee on the Status of Minorities in Astronomy. Uh, in fact, she was the first graduate student ever to be appointed to a AAS leadership position, any leadership position. Uh, so that's phenomenal. She has been the editor of this particular newsletter, which is Spectrum, which has some funny guy at the front of it this, this, uh, this quarter, this, this semester. Um, and in, in this, she's written her own articles in this. She's also organized several workshops uh, and uh, town hall meetings at the American Astronomical <coughs> Society. Uh, so she's been incredibly proactive in that. And I would say one of the most, I'm going to keep going, one of the most outstanding contributions uh, that uh, Dr. Lopez has made to uh, sort of service in the community is in 2004, she conducted the survey um, of faculty demographics, 53 institutions, over 700 faculty. Uh, wide, spanning a very wide range of institution types. Uh, and this was a seminal study. It's still cited today. It's still something that we use today. Ten years old, so we should probably do another one at yes. some point. <laughs> yeah, okay. I won't, yeah. I won't um, but this was such an important study that she was actually asked to present it at Capitol Hill and at the White House as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and so she's made, I would say, outstanding contributions to service. Uh, and I leave that because now she's going to talk about her outstanding contributions to research. Wow. <laughs> Adam almost took up the entire colloquium yeah. with that introduction. 
So I'm very happy to be here. It's been an awesome pleasure talking to all of you. I've had some great conversations while I'm here, and I am excited to share some of my research with you um, on stellar feedback. Stellar feedback is an incredibly multidisciplinary topic, so we're going to touch on a lot of things, including star formation, galaxy formation, uh, the interstellar medium. And so hopefully each person will find something of interest in the talk. Um, and so that was my goal, to try to touch on lots of things so I could get your attention away from the pizza. Um, so in general, I like to start talks with conclusions because I realize that I have your maximum attention right now. And so you, if you want to, you can only pay attention for 30 seconds. But so my conclusions are that stellar feedback plays an important role on both small and large scales. And despite this fundamental influence that feedback has, it is cited as the biggest uncertainty today in galaxy and star formation models. And I'll explain why it's such a big uncertainty. One of the reasons is because there's a lack of observational constraints. And the reason is because it requires observations at many different wavelengths in order to define those observational constraints. I'll show you how you can use current and future multi-wavelength data to assess observationally the role of several stellar feedback mechanisms. And I'll, what I'll do in particular is analyze the dynamics of a large sample of H2 regions and show you what the relative role is uh, it, with the different feedback mechanism in driving the dynamics of the regions. And these relative contributions of the mechanisms provide a lot of information about what regulates star and galaxy formation. And then finally, I'll go over how current and new observatories and surveys uh, can be used in exciting ways to investigate feedback in other ways. So when I say feedback, what do I mean? It's pretty straightforward. It is simply the injection of energy and momentum by stars. There's many ways that stars inject this energy and momentum, so I thought we should first go over what those different mechanisms are. So this is a list. Uh, the first is direct radiation from stars, so that exerts a radiation pressure when it couples to the gas. Secondly, there's a dust processed radiation component. <laughs> so some of that light is scattered by dust, and um, that exerts an associated pressure as well. Then you have ionizing photons from massive stars. You have stellar winds and supernovae, which shock heat gas to 10 to the 7 Kelvin temperatures. You have protostellar outflows and jets. These are particularly important in star clusters where you don't have massive stars. So the only form of feedback is protostellar outflows and jets. Finally, you have high-energy particles, of which I mean cosmic rays. So obviously, this is a very long list. And so that's one of the challenges in the community is trying to assess each one uh, in combination with each other. So most past work has focused on just one mechanism instead of the relative role of these different uh, modes. I want to go over some of the ways that feedback is important, both on a small and large scale. Um, there's a variety of ways that it's important, and I just want to highlight the points that I thought were the coolest. The first cool thing is that feedback is necessary to form realistic galaxies. So I show you a picture of what a galaxy looks like if it doesn't have any feedback and if it does have feedback. And in particular, it was realized in the late 1970s that in the absence of feedback, all of your baryonic material is going to collapse the center of a dark matter potential well and it's going to become so dense that all of the gas is going to be converted to stars. You're going to end up with a bulge and stellar mass that's about 10 times too big. That's some work that Dushan has been doing. And you don't end up with the extended disk structure uh, like we associate with our own Milky Way. However, once you do implement feedback, it acts to remove low angular momentum gas from the galaxy center. You end up with a bulge that's much more realistic as well as the extended disk structure like we have in the Milky Way. So even to just get a galaxy that looks like a galaxy, we need feedback. It's important in a variety of other ways. Another way I want to highlight is that it's important to account for star formation histories. So this is a simulation done by Phil Hopkins where he looks at what is the star formation history with simulations that do or do not have feedback. And what you find out, which you can see in the images, but this is more uh, quantitative demonstration, is that all your gas collapses and forms stars. And in just like a Milky Way type galaxy, you end up with <coughs> over a thousand solar masses formed per year of stars. That's absurdly high. However, if you do implement feedback, then you find that you suppress the star formation, and then you end up with much more moderate star formation rates. 
Now, the implication that it has observationally is that when we look at entire galaxies, we see that very little gas is converted to stars in a dynamical time. So this is the Kennecott-Schmidt relation. It's often shown here. So it's just um, the star formation rate density on the y-axis and then the gas surface density on the x-axis. And the amazing thing is the uniformity of the Kennecott-Schmidt relation. It applies not only for the Mil Milky Way-like galaxies, but also for extreme starbursting galaxies. So, th so this is really a variety of galaxies, and they all seem to have this same inefficiency. In particular, you only end up with about 2% of gas converted to stars in one dynamical time. A third way that feedback is important on galactic scales is galactic scale uh, kiloparsec scale winds. So this is a picture of M82, which is in our local group. And you can see the disk of the galaxy. And then out to kiloparsec lengths, you see this warm gas, 10 to the 4 Kelvin gas. Now, we've detected winds in local group galaxies and then in galaxies that are out to a redshift of 6. So it's very ubiquitous. And we think that the reason there are galactic winds is because of stellar feedback that occurs in that galactic disk. So in particular, the feedback gives the gas enough velocity that it can escape the disk of the galaxy and get out to these large extensions and enrich the, uh, the halos of the galaxies as well as the IGM. <coughs> now, on the small scales, feedback also has an effect. The primary effect is to regulate star formation and make it an inefficient process. And I think that you can see uh, just how inefficient it is if we take an example of our solar neighborhood. So the solar neighborhood has about 10 to the 9 solar masses of molecular gas. And the free fall time is given by the density of the gas. So it's basically telling you, if I have a cloud and it, it has no external forces that are trying to counter gravity, how long does it take for all that gas to collapse on itself, uh, assuming that only gravity is acting? And if you put in a typical density of a, of a GMC, which is about 100 particles per cc, the free fall time scale is only 4.3 mega years. OK, so if that 10 to the 9 solar masses of molecular gas was converted to stars in 4.3 mega years, you would end up with 233 solar masses per year of stars. And the actual rate of star formation in our local neighborhood and in the galaxy in general is two solar masses per year. So the actual star formation rate, even at small scales, is still only about 1% efficiency. That is, like, gas is converted to stars uh, only a very limited amount per free fall time. <coughs> now, I really only highlighted the, ones, the, the ideas that I thought were the funnest or the coolest, um, but really there's a lot more. Um, this is just a list to show you some of the references. Should you be interested, the things that I haven't highlighted so far are that it's necessary to pr produce many of the observational relationships that astronomers like, such as the galaxy luminosity function and the mass metallicity relation. On the small scales, it's important to produce the multi-phase ISM structure, um, as well as to disrupt and destroy GMCs. And finally, the feedback drives turbulence and possibly triggers star formation uh, once it's acting. So despite this extremely fundamental influence, stellar feedback is one of the most uncertain things today in star and galaxy formation. And why is that? So I think these are the three primary challenges associated uh, with stellar feedback. One is that it acts over a very large dynamic range. This presents a challenge to observers and to theorists. Two is that it, there are several modes of feedback. So really, it's necessary to take into account that giant list that I showed you at the beginning. And the third reason is the lack of observational constraints. So I actually want to go through each of these three and explain them in a little bit more detail so we understand just how challenging it is. So related to dynamic range, you have star clusters. and these star clusters, although they're contributing so much energy and momentum, they're really only a, about a parsec across. And those, uh, those parsec across clusters shape molecular gas in GMCs, which are about 100 parsecs across. And those GMCs, which are shaped, are in a 10 kiloparsec galaxy. So we have <coughs> one parsec star cluster shaping a 10 kiloparsec galaxy. So this is 10,000 order, I mean, this is four orders of magnitude that we have to span. And this presents an observational challenge because we have to resolve the small scales but still see the big picture. And this presents a theoretical challenge because we have to be able to probe all of these different scales in our simulations. 
So challenge number two is that there's many mechanisms. Um, each of these needs to be considered independently. And furthermore, depending on which kind of system you have, different ones might dominate. So as an example, I have this plot um, which shows you the amount of energy per unit mass as a function of time for a particular star cluster. And so you can see what's acting um, depending on the age of that cluster. So when the cluster first turns on, the, the main energy source is the bolometric luminosity. That's what's providing the radiation pressure from the cluster. You also see that stellar winds are important. Now, it's only after about three or four mega years when the first supernovae occur. So by the time the supernovae occur, which are in red, all of this energy has been input into that ISM and is already causing the gas to move out. So depending on the age of a cluster that we have, different mechanisms might be dominating. Another uh, sort of condition, different uh, setup that you can have is the mass of the cluster. So I just wanted to highlight the different mechanisms that dominate in low mass versus high mass star clusters. So by low mass star cluster, I mean that you have a cluster that has no stars um, that are above five solar masses. And in that case, all you have is protostellar outflows and jets. There's a little bit of radiation pressure, but essentially you end up with none of these happening. You don't have any ionizing photons because they don't get up to high enough energies. You also don't have any stellar winds on supernovae. Uh, so obviously if we're looking at uh, clouds that only have low mass star clusters, such as the clouds in our nearby Milky Way, then all we're going to have is this. Now, Does if we were the supernovae from the low mass one show up much later? Is that why you scratch it out? No, it's actually because in order to produce a supernova, you need to have above an eight solar mass star. And so if you don't have any massive stars, none of them will be supernovae. So if we do have massive stars, then it turns out that all of the rest of the mechanisms dominate. Protostellar outflows do contribute momentum, but not very much compared to all of these other mechanisms. Uh, so that it just is to highlight the fact that depending on what you're looking at, you really need to consider all of these mechanisms. Now, challenge number three is observational constraints. The reason why we have basically no observational constraints <laughs> is because each of these mechanisms produce radiation at different wavelengths. So I put in orange here what wavelength you would observe these various mechanisms at. And they really span the full entire electromagnetic spectrum. You have, um, let's see, the ionizing photons at the radio. You have protostellar outflows and jets at the IR um, millimeter and optical. Then the various other ones, the optical, IR, and then x-rays with the stellar winds and supernovae. Oh yeah, and then gamma rays and cosmic rays for cosmic rays. Um, so essentially, you have to have data from the entire electromagnetic spectrum in order to constrain all these different processes. Now, if, if at this point you're starting to feel hopeless, like we just can't constrain feedback at all, now I'll present the brighter side, which is that we can. And the reason is because we are really in a golden era of data. So I saw this uh, multi-wavelength Milky Way poster actually in the hallway out here. Um, this, is, this is a pretty uh, popular diagram showing you what the galactic plane looks like as a function of wavelength. So you have the long wavelength data here and then increasing energy going down. So even at this point, um, you know, after several decades of sort of high resolution astronomy data being taken, we really have a lot of information that we can use in order to assess observationally how feedback shapes gas and dust around those stars. And although this is like one of the primary examples, there's actually a lot of data on external galaxies as well. So this is a diagram showing you the different images of the Large Magellanic Cloud at different wavelengths. So you can see the radio, infrared, optical, x-ray, and gamma ray. So we can use these data in order to assess um, how the different feedback modes contribute to the dynamics of the regions. But how do we go from data, images, or spectra to feedback properties? There are three ways that we can do it. Number one is doing optical spectroscopy to get velocities. So this is a diagram from Chilin-Kennecott which shows you uh, the giant H2 region 30 Doradus. 
And they obtained optical spectroscopy, optical spectra, at all these different uh, orientations and positions in the source, and measured the velocities of the different shells. And they found that the velocities are between 25 and 300 kilometers a second. Now, the reason that this constrains what feedback mechanisms dominate in the region is because, depending on what dominates, your, ga your gas is going to move slower or faster. So if, uh, photo if the photoionized gas is what's pushing on the shell, then it's going to move at the sound speed of the warm gas, which is about 10 kilometers per second. However, the shells are actually moving at 25 to 300 kilometers per second. So that tells you that some other mode of feedback is dominating in this region. OK, number two is line ratios. You can use optical or IR line ratios to determine what is dominating your feedback. So this is a commonly invoked diagram uh, by Galaxy people, the BPT diagram. And it basically is just a plot of the four strongest optical emission lines. And you can use it to distinguish whether a galaxy, <coughs> so you're integrating over a whole galaxy, uh, to determine whether it's, its light is predominantly coming from star formation or from an AGN. And you can actually invoke this diagram not only for integrated views of galaxies, but also for individual H2 regions. And in particular, the reason why this works is because where something falls on this diagram is related to whether your photons, which are ionizing, are soft or hard. If you have uh, massive stars, then you're going to have soft photoionization, so you're going to fall on this part of the diagram. If you have uh, hard photoionization, you're going to fall up into the right. Um, and basically, you end up with hard photoionization if you have shocks that are acting. Um, so this gives you a clue. Like, if an H2 region falls in this part of the diagram, then it means that it's dominated by the photoionized gas. If it falls up here, then it's dominated more by supernovae and stellar winds. Number three, and this is the way that I'm going to do it, is based on the pressure. Now, it's not necessarily intuitive how we measure pressure from images. So I like to go through the exact procedure. Plus, it's just fun um, because it involves a lot of radiative processes and ISM. Um, but let me just say right out that this is going to be my sample. These are 32H2 regions in the large and small Magellanic Cloud. Um, they, have a, a, they span a wide range of radii between 3 and 200 parsecs. They span four orders of magnitude alpha luminosity, so that's a proxy of how many massive stars there are in the regions. And they span about one order of magnitude in the mass of the central star cluster. Now, the reason that we chose the LMC and the SMC is because for a few different reasons, it's actually better than looking at things in the Milky Way or, or other external galaxies. So one reason is that it's, they're very close. The LMC is 50 kiloparsecs, and the SMC is 61 kiloparsecs. And unlike looking at the Milky Way, we don't have distance uncertainty. We know that it's 50 kiloparsecs or 61. And these galaxies have both been very well studied across all wavelengths that we can exploit to do our analyses. There's low obscuration. If we look through the galactic plane, you end up with 10 to the 22 or 10 to the 23 in terms of absorbing column densities. When you look at the LMC and the SMC, it's, it's um, orders of magnitude less. So you're, you can see the starlight that is um, generating the feedback. Part of why there's no distance uncertainty with LMC and the SMC is because they're both face on. What that means is when you look at it, you're looking at everything in the same plane. Um, so you don't have to wonder, is something here or something there? It's all uh, basically at the same distance. And finally, it's the site of active star formation. Um, we actually for a variety, well, for unknown reasons, the LMC actually has the most massive star cluster that we know about in the local group. For some reason, we don't have one in the Milky Way. So this pre presents a really good place to look and understand how massive stars shape their environments. So in particular, my test case source is going to be this one right here, uh, which is 30 Doradus. And so we'll zoom in on that one. So 30 Doradus is a giant H2 region in the LMC. This is a three-color image, which shows you the X-rays in blue. Uh, so that's the hot gas from stellar winds and supernovae. Then we have the H-alpha in green, which is the 10 to the 4 Kelvin gas. Um, then you have dust at 8 microns, and then CO. Now, at the center of this region, we have R136, which is a 5 times 10 to the 4 solar mass star cluster. 
Um, this is a very massive cluster. It has 2,400 OB stars. Depending on who you ask, some people claim that there are four stars above 150 solar masses. That seems kind of extreme. Uh, I don't know if I buy it. But needless to say, there are very, very massive stars here that are shaping their environment. Um, in the white contours, you can see the molecular gas that has been pushed out. So probably this was much more spherical back in the day when the stars began to form. But now this feedback has begun to push it outward and sort of in a odd shape. Now, 30 Doradus um, has been observed at very, very high resolution. So on top of getting the integrated pressures from all the different components, we can actually divide up 30 door into 441 <coughs> equally little sized boxes. There are about 10 parsecs across. And we can calculate the pressures associated with the different feedback mechanisms in each of these 441 boxes to produce maps of how the pressure uh, vary, in particular, how the pressure varies with distance from that central star cluster, R136. I determined the size of this box based on the quality, quality of the data. The, the main limiting step was actually the X-ray data um, because we had to extract X-ray spectrum spectra. Um, so again, since it's not intuitive how you go from data to pressures, I like to go through the exact process. And, um, and I break both of the cardinal rules of giving talks, which is don't give equations and don't give tables. Because I actually think that both are not bad, you know, because we're scientists. So I think you guys can handle it. Um, so first, we start with the direct radiation from stars. This is given by the energy density of the light that's emitted by the stars. And that's given by the bolometric luminosity of those stars. How do we obtain their bolometric luminosity? Well, we use UVV photometry. And so this is an HST image of, of the region of 30 door. And so the way that I calculate the pressures is I take a given box, and I take the center of that box, and I calculate the pressure felt in that box from all 10,000 stars that are in the region. And then I sum them together. So I had to consolidate several data sets together, both from HST so that we could resolve the individual stars in the central star cluster, which is very dense, and then some ground-based data um, to get the entire outskirt. So when I put that all together, this is the map of the direct radiation pressure across 30 door. You can see that right at the center where the central star cluster is, that's where you have the most pressure. That makes sense. And it falls off as 1 over r squared because of that term right there. And it's not quite uniform. And the reason is because, aside from R136 right at the middle, there's other star clusters, too, that are contributing. So depending on where those star clusters are, you can get an elevated pressure. So there's no connection for absorption? Yeah, so we're just calculating the momentum available to push on the gas. OK, so the second pressure term that we calculate is the dust processed radiation component. This is given by the energy density of the light that's absorbed by the dust. You can get a handle on that parameter using IRS demodeling. And in particular, this is a, a plot of basically flux versus wavelength that shows you what the relationship is. And essentially, it's that if you have a, a higher energy density of light that's being absorbed by the dust, your SED is going to move over to the left. Basically, because you're going to make hotter dust, you're going to peak at shorter wavelengths. So we took the uh, Spitzer data for the entire region, and we basically plotted the SUD and, and calculated what that energy density is of the light that's absorbed by the dust. You end up with this map uh, for the dust processed component. You can see that it's not as significant as the direct radiation component, um, but it still is you know, contributing non-negligibly. Um, and it, that it is greater than the direct radiation pressure at the shell of the source, which is around the edge. Thirdly, we have the warm H2 gas. This is the 10 to the 4 Kelvin gas. So the pressure is given by an ideal gas law. Um, so it's related to the electron density and the temperature of the 10 to the 4 Kelvin gas. There's actually a variety of ways that you can get that electron density. One is to use the flux density of the free free emission at 3.5 centimeters. So this is basically just straight from Rybicki and Lightman. Um, it's chapter five, if you care. Um, 
So essentially all we do is we calculate the flux using radio data and then we convert that to an electron density. So this is the, on the left is the map that I produced of the electron density across the source. It varies from about 100 particles per cc to about 500 particles per cc, which is roughly the order of magnitude that, that is expected. There's actually a variety of fun ways that you can calculate the warm electron density. Another way is based on infrared uh, fine structure line ratios. And so this is a map that Rumi and Debiteau produced of the electron density um, in this very central region. And I just show it because, well, it's pretty awesome that it has the same, roughly the same shape as mine, um, and they're actually the same, roughly the same numbers. So two entirely different ways to get the electron density, um, which are totally unrelated to each other, and yet it gives the same results. Makes you feel like you're doing things right. Um, so this is the final map of the warm 10 to the 4 Kelvin gas pressure. You can see that it's roughly equal to the, the um, dust process component. It's not quite as significant as the direct radiation pressure uh, at the center, but you can see that between these other two, it dominates at the shell. Um, I should have said that all of these maps are on the exact same color scheme, so you can compare and contrast the different, um, the different pressure components. OK, so finally, we have the hot shocked gas. This is the gas that shock heated by the stellar winds and the supernovae. This is given by the density and temperature of the 10 to the 7 Kelvin gas. You can obtain both of those parameters by doing spectral modeling of the Bremsstrahlung emission. And that's what Chandra, XMM, or ROSAT uh, can be used for. So if anyone is not familiar uh, with, with X-ray data, this is an example spectrum that you obtain between like 0.5 to a few keV. And Essentially, the continuum is mostly given by Bremsstrahlung. And depending on the density of the gas, your, um, the, the normalization of the spectrum changes. And then depending on the temperature of the gas, the, um, the spectrum turns over uh, at a different place. So if it's hotter, the spectrum turns over at higher energies. So we model the X-ray spectra just like this for all 441 of our boxes. and we get the temperature on the left and the density on the right. You can see that the density is very remarkably uniform, except that it's a little bit enhanced here. And you know what's here is a supernova remnant. So that's why it's actually hotter and more dense uh, in that region. On the left, you see the temperature map. And it's pretty interesting because you can see that the temperatures are elevated in particular places. If we were to overlay uh, what the warm gas um, distribution is, all of the warm gas would fall where these temperature elevations are. So basically your hot gas is hitting the warm gas and it raises the temperature. And that's low density. Uh, yeah, the x-ray gas is low density. It's around uh, one particle per cc. So this is our final map for the hot x-ray gas pressure. Again, these are the same color maps. So already you can see that the hot gas is basically negligible compared to the other ones. Um, and I'm going to talk about why that is. But essentially, the x-rays do not contribute much to the overall dynamics of the region. So we can take our maps and we can bin them by radius from the central star cluster to understand how they vary with distance from R136. And this is what you find. The, the direct radiation pressure dominates in blue out to a radius of about 75 parsecs. And then at that point, the, the red points, which are the warm gas pressure, uh, begin to take over. By comparison, the x-rays are pretty negligible. Uh, and the, the dust process component in orange is not negligible, but it's, it's a little bit lower than the warm gas, especially at larger radii. Um, I'm going to talk in a few minutes about why uh, the dust and the warm gas are roughly equal in the middle of the source. But, but for right now, all you need to know is that the direct radiation pressure dominates out to 75 parsecs, and then the warm gas takes over. So what does this mean? I think there are two important implications. One is that until the source was 75 parsecs in radius, the radiation pressure dominated. Okay. Now, I think most people, or 
I think the sort of classical H2 region is one where it's just dominated by the, um, the warm gas pressure. So how is a radiation pressure dominated H2 region different? There's a few, there's a few key differences. There's more momentum imparted to the shell. There's accelerated expansion at early times relative to the, the classical H2 region. And then really the most important implication is that the shell expands at a much faster speed than the sound speed of a warm gas and the escape velocity of the central star cluster. Now, this is very important, this right here, because what it tells you is that radiation pressure can impart sufficient velocity to the gas for it to be expelled from the region. Essentially, uh, the warm gas doesn't have enough speed to escape the cluster, but the radiation pressure dominated gas does have enough speed to ex be expelled. And the reason why that's important is because we want star formation to be inefficient. We've seen that in the observations. Now we need to explain it. And this offers a viable explanation because it says that once your massive stars turn on and they start radiating, then they're going to push the gas out and cause it to escape the cluster. Now the second thing I want to talk about, the second implication, is the low X-ray gas pressure. Why in the world is it so low? People always think that supernovae are the dominant feedback mode, and I'm telling you it's not. So why is that? And the reason is because of the lack of confinement of the hot gas. So you can understand this with my little cartoon bubbles here. So if you have no confinement, basically all of the stellar wind energy and hot gas just streams out into the ISM, you end up with a very low pressure and low luminosity. Now, at the opposite end, you can have 100% confinement. And what that means is that you have a cold shell surrounding all the star clusters, and all of your stellar wind and supernova energy is going to be confined to that shell, so you're going to have all of that energy right in the middle, and you're going to end up with a high pressure and a high luminosity. Now, in the real world, there's actually holes in the shell, and the reason is because you have an inhomogeneous ISM. That inhomogeneous ISM is going to create holes in the shell as it expands, and the, uh, the hot gas can escape through those holes, and that produces an intermediate pressure and an intermediate luminosity. So what we're realizing is that this partial confinement case is likely the reason why we end up with low X-ray gas pressures. Now, I told you toward the beginning that we did a large sample of sources. So 30 door was really just our test case. So now we're going to expand our sample and have it be all 32 of these regions. Now, we're all, we all love my table, I'm sure. And we're not going to go through it again, but it's basically the same procedure. Okay? Except this time, instead of mapping the pressures across the source, we're just going to calculate the pressures that's felt at the shell. And the reason is because these H2 regions are going to be smaller than 30 door. 30 door is really big. And so we don't quite have the spatial resolution to, to do the maps. Not yet, but in the future we will. So this is the results when I do all 32 sources. And this is a complex diagram, so we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit. So on the y-axis, you have the individual pressure components. On the x-axis, you have the total pressure, so all four components added together for each source. Now, these lines tell you how much the individual components contribute to the total. So how far below this line right here a point falls tells you how significant or not significant it is. The orange points are the warm gas pressure. You can see that it contributes roughly 80% of the total pressure in the region. So that's what's dominating, the photoionized gas. Then you have the red points, which are the dust process components, and the light blue points, which are the x-ray components. You can see that it's only, they only they contribute roughly equally, um, and they're about a factor of two to five below the, uh, the warm gas pressure. So they're, they're contributing only about 10% each to the total pressure. And then down here, you have the direct radiation pressure. These are contributing less than 1% to the total pressure. It's super insignificant. Um, one, Is 30 derivatives on this? Yes. So it is part of our sample. And when we do the integrated pressures, we see that the photoionized gas dominates. Sorry, what is P here? P here is the direct radiation pressure. 
So, so it's what's, what's directly the opacity of the shell. Well, it's the it's the momentum that's available to to be imparted to the gas from the stars directly from the stars to the gas without the dust being considered. How are you measuring T here? Um, so that's given by the bolometric luminosity of the stars, L over C. Oh, it's the first one you talked about. Yes, okay. yes, exactly. Okay. okay. So um, your door on that plot is, is consistent with all this. Yes, it is. It P here is dominated, but not at the shell. Yes, exactly. That's the key point. So our result that the P deer well, dominates. At this point, I have to interject that yeah. the correct definition of radiation pressure is the rate of flux times the opacity. So it's not the energy density of the radiation. So I disagree. And I mean, yes, there are two ways. There are two ways to do, uh, to define radiation pressure. And the question is, what are you after? Are you after? Um, the, the reason why we don't use the definition that you just said is because really that's just a map of what the density is of the gas in the region. But we don't really care about where the gas is distributed currently. We just want to see how much energy is available. You're interested in overall energetic. Yes. That's the source. Yes. Yes. So really we just want to see if there was a parcel of gas at this radius, how much pressure would there be on it? Whereas if you put opacity into the calculation, then you're dependent on, is the gas actually there? But isn't this for shells? It is for shells, so yeah. shells are dense. Yes, but the shell, the shell is far out now. It wasn't originally. So it is true that, um, the, the pro that those photons will be absorbed by the shell and felt. I, I follow what you're saying. Okay, cool. So. So then we infer that that radiation pressure, so defined, did not drive the expansion of these shells. Yes, exactly. Um, one other point that I want to highlight with this diagram is these little arrows. So I probably didn't pick it out right away, but only half of these light blue points are actually points. The rest are little arrows. And the reason why they're little arrows is because they weren't detected in x-rays. And it turns out that all of the SMC sources, even though they've been imaged by XMM, which is a really good x-ray telescope, none of them were detected. And so these are actually all upper limits. So that tells you at the most they can contribute 10% of the pressure. They might very well be down here and only contribute 1% of the pressure. Um, but these were just the limits that we were able to set uh, using the available XMM data. Do you add the limits into the total pressure? Yes. So basically, I take the limit and I assume that it's the the actual X-ray gas pressure. Yes. Okay. And so again, why are those so low? It's because of the lack of confinement. So I have a question in that area. Um, I guess I'm, I'm uncomfortable with the fact that the fact that the X-ray pressure is low today implies that the x-rays didn't do anything significant. It's sort of a history type question. Yes. So I 100% agree with you. And it's true that the x-rays do not contribute today. And it very well could be that they contributed early on because they were more confined at earlier stages. And I'm going to get to that in a second. But I think that means that it's very important to look at earlier evolutionary stages than the sources that we're looking at. OK. So another implication of our work, besides the lack of confinement, is the fact that the dust process component can be amplified relative to the direct radiation component. And in fact, if you go back to this diagram again, basically look at how much greater the red points are from the blue points. They're amplified relative to the direct radiation pressure by about a factor of 10 to 400. And this is consistent with the simulations that Krumholtz and Thompson are doing, showing that there, there's a substantial uh, dust process component. There can be substantial momentum uh, in, the, in the dust component um, that can be imparted to the gas. And in fact, it can be amplified up to the point where the dust contributes equally as the warm gas. And that's what they find in their simulations. And that's the reason why they're equal in 30-door. 
So I don't have the plot in the talk again, but if you remember, the dust and the warm gas were equal out to a radius of like 50 parsecs. And that's the reason why they're equal, is because um, the dust was amplified to the point where they are equal. Now, of course, the advantage of doing a sample is that we want to see if there are any trends. And so this is just one plot to show you that there are no trends. Um, so this is pressure as a function of the, the radius of the shell. And if you like squint just a little bit, you can maybe convince yourself that the small sources are have higher pressures than than the big sources. But obviously, it's sort of just a, a scatter plot. Um, but the thing is that these are all evolved sources. So they're at ages which are probably three to ten mega years. And really, what we want to do is we want to sample even earlier stages. So when the points would be further to the left of this diagram and see which ones dominate right when the stars turn on. Yeah. So are there no error bars on the infrared and hill points or are they too small? Sorry? Are on the infrared? No error bars on the infrared and orange points or are they yeah. too small? Yeah. So they are not too small. And um, <clears throat> so error is one thing I haven't talked about yet, or, or that I wasn't planning to talk about, but it's a very good question. So in the case of the infrared, we actually have a very, very good measurement on um, the energy density, and um, because the Spitzer data is so good, and because um, the energy density is uh, measured so well from what the SED looks like. Um, so actually, our errors on the IR is only 1%. Um, so they're, they're just as small as they should be. Um, for the x-rays, it's, it's, they're really large. And also for the uh, direct radiation pressure, they're very large. A lot of that uncertainty is how we define radius. So these sources are not quite clear cut, like, oh, there's the shell. Um, so we actually did surface brightness profiles to define the radius. And um, given, oh, I'm glad Adam told me that. <laughs> so then, anyway, um, yeah, given the uncertainties of the radius, that's the size error bars that you get. So there are no trends. It's because they're evolved sources. So we want to look at other kinds of sources. So I just want to take the last few minutes to highlight some future work that I want to do. And I'm going to sort of go from like what I want to do like in the next six months to much more further into the future, you know, high in the sky, like what I would do if I had infinite time and resources. Um, so first, I would like to look at sources which are in earlier evolutionary phases. And in particular, there's this class of sources called ultra-compact H2 regions. And they're sources where the massive stars have literally just turned on. They have radii of less than 0.1 parsecs. So this is an order of magnitude smaller than the sources I've looked at. And you're like, really, those things exist? And they do. And they exist, actually, in a large number. So this is some pictures of those sources. And they currently know of 200 of them in the Milky Way. So we can do our same pressure analysis on these very small sources. And I predict that the, the pressure terms have a very different relationship in these sources. In particular, I do expect that the X-ray gas pressure and the radiation pressure would be most significant at this stage because all of that energy is confined. Basically, the holes in the shell have not been made yet. OK, so second thing I want to do is look at feedback in other kinds of environments. So in particular, I would really like to look at clusters in starbursts and galaxies, like M82, um, where you have much more massive star clusters powering the regions. So in M82, shown here, they know of 200 massive star clusters. And they have a mass of around 10 to the 6 solar masses. So that's 20 times bigger than 30 door. And the question is, how do they launch the gas out to these kiloparsec scales? And there's some really cool work. Wait, I'll turn on the next slide, actually, possibly. Um, and we want to understand how the gas gets out of the disk um, and which mechanisms dominate in those extreme conditions. Another kind of condition I want to look at is the exact opposite case, where you have extremely low metallicity gas. And a really good place to look is actually in the bridge between the LMC and the SMC. 
So there was a tidal interaction between these two galaxies about 200 mega years ago, and there's this stream of gas that's left over uh, from that tidal interaction. And although it was 200 mega years ago, there are O stars in that stream. And so they were formed after that tidal interaction occurred. And so you end up with gas that's about 1 to 5% solar metallicity, so super low metallicity. And it's also gas that's not even in a galaxy. OK, so this is kind of an awesome place to think about what feedback does in the early universe when you have lower metallicity environments. OK, so another topic that I want to look at is cosmic rays. Back in my list of feedback mechanisms, I totally dropped cosmic rays. I don't know if any of you know, noticed that. Um, and the reason is because we have basically very little observational constraints currently in cosmic rays. We see them going around the Milky Way. We know that they contribute 10 to 20 percent of the energy density of the ISM in the Milky Way. But we don't have any direct evidence of how um, cosmic rays are accelerated in star-forming regions. In terms of energetics, we expect supernova to be the primary place where cosmic rays are accelerated. But there's actually been no uh, direct observational evidence of those particles right when they are being accelerated, because gamma ray and cosmic ray uh, observatories don't have the spatial resolution. And, um, <clears throat> and I have a really awesome, fun solution to that problem, which is to use millimeter observations. And this seems not intuitive, because millimeter is at the entire opposite end of the electromagnetic spectrum. But the reason why it makes sense is because cosmic rays ionize molecules. And so you can get this gas, which is otherwise self-shielded, and it's going to be penetrated by those cosmic rays. And that's going to create molecular ions, which are observable by uh, Plateau de Burr and Alma. So this cycle I propose to observe uh, this shock front in a supernova remnant with Alma to try to map the molecular ions. And depending on the strengths of the molecular ions, you can actually get a handle of what the cosmic ray acceleration efficiency is, and thus what the cosmic ray pressure is. So I alluded to this when, when I was talking about M82. We want to understand better how galactic winds are launched. And <clears throat> this is some totally awesome work that was done recently um, on NGC 253, which has a large-scale galactic wind. So this is 253. You can see um, the galactic disk. And although it doesn't look like it has a, a, a large-scale wind like M82, it does. And it just you can't see it very much in the optical. And when they imaged it with Alma, they saw that you had this sort of um, multi-phase structure where you have the hot gas in the middle of the outflow. And then right outside of that, you have the H-alpha, the, the warm gas, the 10 to the 4 Kelvin gas. And then right outside that, you have the molecular gas. So you have this multi-phase jet that's just coming off the edge there. How is that launched? And how does that multi-phase gas survive kiloparsecs outside of these galaxies? Feedback is clearly what's launching it. So how do you get that out? And what's important here is to go back and look at these star clusters that are launching those winds to understand better how we end up with this three-phase wind. OK. And then finally, there's several long-term questions that we want to answer. Sorry, will that be just uh, done with Alma, the CL component? Yeah, so you, it, it's really a combination <laughs> of, of lots of facilities. So um, in particular, yeah, you want to map the CO um, to understand how much gas is is lost from from the galaxy. And this is really important because it's going to take gas away from that's forming stars and galaxy. It's essentially going to stop the, the star formation in the galaxy. And then even cooler, you could have stars form in the outflow, which is absurdly awesome. <laughs> so, um, so yes, yeah, so you want to observe it with Alma, um, particularly because these galaxies are megaparsecs away. Or not megaparsecs, sorry. Yeah, megaparsecs. Um, megaparsecs away, so you need the spatial resolution of ALMA to get it. Um, but then you also need optical and X-ray in order to get the other phases. Um, and so in that sense, you do also need high resolution um, optical like you can get with Keck and TMT. Just on that picture, yep. 
Do you have any idea why the structure remains the hot inside and cooler as it goes out if it's a result of lots and lots of star clusters going on? So it's one picture that I didn't put in here because it's, to it's too complex, I think, for this talk. Not because you guys couldn't handle it, but just because it has a lot of arrows and things. Um, essentially, if you trace back where this outflow originates, it goes back to four very massive star clusters. And so, and you can see the shells. When you look at it with Alma, you can see the shells around those clusters. So they're definitely the things that are pushing the, the gas out. I have no idea why it ends up being this structure. Um, this is really a new result that people hadn't quite appreciated until a few months ago. OK, so long-term questions that we want to explore. We want to understand how stellar feedback changes and conditions. Because um, really, I think the ultimate goal would be to give simulators a rubric for how feedback acts. You know, if I have a certain metallicity and a certain mass cluster in a certain density, how much momentum is given as a function of time? And I think we really have to sample observationally a lot of different conditions in order to do that. Secondly, we want to understand how stellar feedback influences the IMF of forming stars. Now, in order to do that, we really need to sample these star clusters. And, and in order to do that, we need to spatially resolve all of them. So telescopes like TMT are key to be able to identify the clusters that are powering these H2 regions. Um, currently, with Keck, you can go out to several of the, of the local group galaxies. But with TMT, you can go an order of magnitude farther, around 50 galaxies. Um, so that's going to be a really exciting parameter space to explore. Um, of course, we also want to understand how stellar feedback relates to the conditions of the giant molecular clouds. And in particular, what I want to understand is how the feedback acts to disrupt the clouds and also how it drives turbulence. We see that turbulence um, is maintained over the lifetime of, of a giant molecular cloud, it, whereas it should dissipate if there was no source of energy um, driving it. And we think possibly that it could be feedback that's driving that turbulence. So we want to understand that better observationally. And then finally, I've sort of alluded to this, is how in the world should feedback be incorporated into galaxy formation and evolution simulations? I think people have lots of different strategies for doing it. And sometimes it's not quite the best that it could be. Um, a lot of the physics of stellar feedback is in what's called subgrid models. So you're just, uh, you have a single point for all of the complex physics that I've talked about. And, um, and you tweak around and you say, oh, let's turn off cooling. And oh, you know. So it's, um, it's not the best, but it's getting better. Um, so these are my conclusions, which I presented to you before. And I'm sure you all remember it perfectly. So I will just take your questions. Thanks. Yes, David. Uh, what, what did you do about projection from three dimensions into two the oppression measurement? Yeah, that's an awesome question. So uh, we spent a long time, <laughs> by me, I mean I, in an appendix, um, deprojecting the stars and, and, and trying to, assuming spherical symmetry, trying to sort of see what the three dimensional um, distribution of the stars could be. And then I calculated the pressure. Uh, the, the radiation pressure, um, both like correcting for uh, the projection effects um, and not projecting and seeing how it changed the result. And it did change the result for like the central 10 parsecs or so, but that was it. Um, and then once you got far enough out from the star cluster, it didn't really matter. Um, so it changed the results for the first data point or two, but that was about it. Is the deprojection the same with all the different uh, driving mechanisms? Um, basically, yes. For the for the gas, you have to assume some filling factor. So that's the uncertainty there. And so for both of the, um, in the phases of gas, we assume the filling factor was 1, which it almost certainly isn't. But since we justify that, because we want to see what the pressure is on the shell. And so um, you want to account, you want to assume that the gas is filling the whole volume to see what the the pressure is on the shell. How did you find the shell? Where did, how did you find what, what the shell? 
Yeah, so that was actually one of the hardest parts. Not hard, but more hand weavy, I guess. Um, so I took the H alpha maps of these galaxies and uh, made surface brightness profiles. And I defined the radius as 90%, like where 90% of the flux was enclosed. I did try varying that, like how much, how does it change if I do 85% or 95%? Because, you know, it doesn't really matter. Um, and it didn't really change. So um, we couldn't really think of a better way to do it. And it, it is somewhat challenging. And, and that is what contributes a lot to the error bars in the plots that I showed. So on the, these issues associated with dwarf toroidal galaxies uh, and dark matter, too big to fail, for example, I mean, I, I'm glad of, these are new things to me about, about the energetics and, and out of those. Yeah. So what are the implications for, for those issues? I mean, I, I didn't see you're, you're not saying that, that um, supernovae and, and massive stars are not efficient in blowing baryons out of potential wells. But it looks like the mechanisms whereby they do that in, in, in your work are different than at least I, I knew about it. So. Yeah, I mean, I think it's not hard to get the baryons out uh, in these dwarf spheroidals because the escape velocities are so small. And so I, I agree that they have to go out. And whether that's supernovae or if it's a different mechanism, I don't think it, I think it's relatively easy to achieve. So the exact mechanism of it, um, although I might disagree about how it gets out, I, I do agree that it gets out. Are there nucleosynthetic implications for, you know, the, the detailed way it gets out in, in your work, for example? I mean, the, the different predictions uh, for what kinds of elements get blown out or left behind? In those yeah, that's a very good question. And, um, you know, given that the gas is being pushed out before the supernovae occur, then it means that they're going to be less enriched. And so I haven't thought along those lines before, um, but it, it, it all depends on once whether the supernovae happen, they may still push on the gas. It's just going to be farther away than it was before. Um, so I have to think more along those lines. But yeah, I guess I would predict that there would be less enrichment. So they're either odd. Is there a lot? Is there an a lot of evidence that there hasn't been a supernova in a central star cluster that has that has left that essentially warm gas is pushing on the shell that you're seeing um, yeah. behind as a remnant. Is there evidence that that was not due to a supernova originally? So yes and no. So the central star cluster R136 is only two mega years old. So it itself it okay. itself has not had a supernova. But there are other star clusters right. that are in the region and those have had supernovae happen. And um, in fact, there are neutron stars, pulsars, in the region. So we know that supernovae have happened. Um, it's just not the central star cluster where they've occurred. Okay. Okay. <coughs> are, are the pressures you're measuring consistent with the velocity of your seeing and the momentum? Yes, they are. Um, so that's one thing that I want to do, because there hasn't been, um, in the Milky Way, they have an awesome, awesome data set where they have measured all the um, the velocities using optical spectroscopy. But it hasn't been done as much in external galaxies, and so that's one thing I want to do is is go back and um, do see what how fast all the gas is moving um, because it's a good check on our calculations. For the case of 30 Duratus, we see that the shells are moving up to 300 kilometers a second, which means that you either have to have winds or supernovae, which I don't think it is, or radiation pressure. Um, so, but it is consistent with it uh, being this um, the feedback modes that I've suggested. So you can get 300 kilometers a second from radiation pressure. Yeah. Yep. So all of the dynamics you're talking about happens in a relatively early part of this cluster's life. It's not giga years, and that's why you don't think about type 1A supernovae. Yeah, exactly. So um, I, I didn't talk very much about the life cycle of giant molecular clouds, but they actually only live for about 30 mega years. So by the time the type 1A supernovae happen, they have cleared environments. Um, and that's why type 1A supernovae tend to happen in 
among older stellar populations and lower density um, mediums, media. So if you use X-ray observations to look at the silicon and calcium or whatever, you would predict the ratio should be for type 2s and not for type 1s? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That should be testable. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Laura Lopez. Uh, she is simultaneously a NASA Einstein Fellow and a Papillardo Fellow at MIT. Uh, she's taken all the fel all fellowships all at once. Um, she earned her PhD um, recently in 2011 from UC Santa Cruz, uh, where while she was a graduate student, she also earned the UC President's Dissertation Fellowship, the AAUW, American Association of University Women Fellowship, the Cultural Robles Fellowship, and an NS Graduate Fellowship. So she was swimming in money. <laughs> um, she was previously at uh, MIT, where she earned her bachelor's in science and physics. She also had minors in astronomy and political science, which I thought was very interesting. Uh, and while she was there, she kept winning more prizes. I guess this was back in time, since that was the first one. But she won the, the Bartlett Prize, which is the best thesis in, in astrophysics. And she also won the Orloff Prize, which is an award they give to uh, students who do unusual levels of service. And I'll talk about that in just a second. She's also gotten lots of other awards and prizes, like the APS Young Star Award, the AAS Beth Brown Prize. She's, she's prized, I would say. Um, uh, Dr. Lopez studies uh, the, the whole breadth of star formation, uh, formation, evolution, and demise. Um, she uses observations across the electromagnetic spectrum, from infrared out to x-ray, uh, and also radio, to, and works very closely, importantly, to, with theorists. Uh, to test the models. I think that's actually a particular strength of Dr. Lopez. She really works with the theorists and also I think gets their observing time because they don't apply for observing true, time. That's true, that's true. It's a secret, <laughs> but not secret anymore. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's been broadcast now. Um, so her work includes investigations of star formation, in particular star feedback, and how stars form and how clusters form. Uh, she looks at the life cycles of giant molecular clouds. This is now moving into the galactic perspective. And she also looks how feedback, stellar feedback, shapes not just <coughs> the clusters, but also galactic winds and even the galaxies themselves. And then from the sort of the other end of the stellar life cycle, she studies supernova in great detail. Uh, she uses morphological, spectral, and environmental studies to understand what the progenitors are. She searches for the survivors <coughs> of the supernovae. And she also looks at particle acceleration in her X-ray uh, X-ray observational work. Um, and that would be fantastic for anyone. However, I also want to point out that uh, Dr. Lopez is, is a mystery with simulations that do or do not have feedback. And what you find out, which you could see in the images, but this is more uh, quantitative demonstration, is that all your gas collapses and forms stars. And in just like a Milky Way type galaxy, you end up with <coughs> over a thousand solar masses formed per year of stars. That's absurdly high. However, if you do implement feedback, then you find that you suppress the star formation, and then you end up with much more moderate star formation rates. Now, the implication that it has observationally is that when we look at entire galaxies, we see that very little gas is converted to stars in a dynamical time. So this is the Kennecott-Schmidt relation. It's often shown here. So it's just um, the star formation rate density on the y-axis and then the gas surface density on the x-axis. And the amazing thing is the uniformity of the Kennecott-Schmidt relation. It applies not only for the Mil Milky Way-like galaxies, but also for extreme star-bursting galaxies. So this is really a variety of galaxies, and they all seem to have this same inefficiency. In particular, you only end up with about 2% of gas converted to stars in one dynamical time. A third way that feedback is important on galactic scales is galactic scale par uh, kiloparsec scale winds. So this is a picture of M82, which is in our local group. And you can see the disk of the galaxy. And then out to kiloparsec lengths, you see this warm gas, 10 to the 4 Kelvin gas. Now, we've detected winds in local group galaxies and then in galaxies that are out to a redshift of 6. So it's very ubiquitous. And we think that the reason there are galactic winds is because of stellar feedback that occurs in that galactic disk. So in particular, the feedback gives the gas enough velocity that it can escape the disk of the galaxy and get out to these large extensions and enrich the, uh, the halos of the galaxies, as well as the IGM. <coughs> now, on the small scales, 
feedback also has an effect. The primary effect is to regulate star formation and make it an inefficient process. And I think that you can see uh, just how inefficient it is if we take an example of our solar neighborhood. So the solar neighborhood has about direct radiation from stars, so that exerts a radiation pressure when it couples to the gas. Secondly, there's a dust process radiation component. <laughs> so some of that light is scattered by dust, and um, that exerts an associated pressure as well. Then you have ionizing photons from massive stars. You have stellar winds and supernovae, which shock heat gas to 10 to the 7 Kelvin temperatures. You have protostellar outflows and jets. These are particularly important in star clusters where you don't have massive stars, so the only form of feedback is protostellar outflows and jets. Finally, you have high-energy particles, of which I mean cosmic rays. So obviously this is a very long list. And so that's one of the challenges in the community is trying to assess each one uh, in combination with each other. So most past work has focused on just one mechanism instead of the relative role of these different uh, modes. I want to go over some of the ways that feedback is important, both on a small and large scale. Um, there's a variety of ways that it's important, and I just want to highlight the points that I thought were the coolest. The first cool thing is that feedback is necessary to form realistic galaxies. So I show you a picture of what a galaxy looks like if it doesn't have any feedback and if it does have feedback. And in particular, it was realized in the late 1970s that in the absence of feedback, all of your baryonic material is going to collapse the center of a dark matter potential well, and it's going to become so dense that all of the gas is going to be converted to stars. You're going to end up with a bulge and stellar mass that's about 10 times too big. That's some work that Dushan has been doing. And you don't end up with the extended disk structure uh, like we associate with our own Milky Way. However, once you do implement feedback, it acts to remove low angular momentum gas from the galaxy center. You end up with a bulge that's much more realistic, as well as the extended disk structure like we have in the Milky Way. So even to just get a galaxy that looks like a galaxy, we need feedback. It's important in a variety of other ways. Another way I want to highlight is that it's important to account for star formation histories. So this is a simulation done by Phil Hopkins where he looks at what is the star formation history. Remarkable leader in our community from the perspective of, of service. Uh, I would say she has single-handedly made prominent, lasting, positive impacts on the climate of astronomy for, for women, for minorities, for the LGBT community, in fact, for everybody, uh, because the kind of work she does actually helps the entire community uh, function, I think, better. Um, she started this as an undergraduate where she began the Undergraduate Women in Physics program, which is still very active today. Um, when she was at UC Santa Cruz, she organized she organized the faculty. She organized the faculty. Enough said. <laughs> to present career talks for the graduates, of which she was one. Um, she was also a member of the admissions committee, and she investigated biases in the GRE scores. And as a result of her research, uh, the UC Santa Cruz has started to apply a calibration, essentially. If they're all instrumentalists, you apply calibrations when your detector is not exactly uniform. Uh, they call that the Lopez correction at Santa Cruz. Uh, and many other <laughs> institutions, including Caltech and Harvard and several other ones, have now adopted similar uh, sort of calibration effects for, for scores. And so she's a, a major leader in that aspect. Um, she's been a longstanding member of the American uh, Astronomical Society's <coughs> Committee on the Status of Minorities in Astronomy. Uh, in fact, she was the first graduate student ever to be appointed to a AAS leadership position, any leadership position. Uh, so that's phenomenal. She has been the editor of this particular newsletter, which is Spectrum, which has some funny guy at the front of it this this, uh, this quarter, this, this semester. Um, and in, in this, she's written her own articles in this. She's also organized several workshops uh, and uh, town hall meetings at the American Astronomical <coughs> Society. Uh, so she's been incredibly proactive in that. And I would say one of the most, I'm going to keep going, one of the most outstanding contributions uh, that uh, Dr. Lopez has made to uh, sort of service in the community is in 2004, she conducted the survey um, of faculty demographics, 53 institutions, over 700 faculty, uh, spanning a very wide range of institution types. Uh, and this was a seminal study. It's still cited today. It's still something that we use today. 10 years old, so we should probably do another one at yes. some point. <laughs> Yeah, okay, I want, yeah. I want to um, but this was such an important study that she was actually asked to present it at Capitol Hill and at the White House as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and so she's made, I would say, outstanding contributions to service 
Uh, and I leave that because now she's going to talk about her outstanding contributions to research. Wow. <laughs> Adam almost took up the entire colloquium yeah. with that introduction. So I'm very happy to be here. It's been an awesome pleasure talking to all of you. I've had some great conversations while I'm here. And I am excited to share some of my research with you um, on stellar feedback. Stellar feedback is an incredibly multidisciplinary topic. So we're going to touch on a lot of things, including star formation, galaxy formation, uh, the interstellar medium. And so hopefully each person will find something of interest in the talk. Um, and so that was my goal, to try to touch on lots of things so I could get your attention away from the pizza. Um, so in general, I like to start talks with conclusions because I realize that I have your maximum attention right now. And so you, if you want to, you can only pay attention for 30 seconds. But so my conclusions are that stellar feedback plays an important role on both small and large scales. And despite this fundamental influence that feedback has, it is cited as the biggest uncertainty today in galaxy and star formation models. And I'll explain why it's such a big uncertainty. One of the reasons is because there's a lack of observational constraints. And the reason is because it requires observations at many different wavelengths in order to define those observational constraints. I'll show you how you can use current and future multi-wavelength data to assess observationally the role of several stellar feedback mechanisms. And I'll, what I'll do in particular is analyze the dynamics of a large sample of H2 regions and show you what the relative role is uh, it, with the different feedback mechanism in driving the dynamics of the regions. And these relative contributions of the mechanisms provide a lot of information about what regulates star and galaxy formation. And then finally, I'll go over how current and new observatories and surveys uh, can be used in exciting ways to investigate feedback in other ways. So when I say feedback, what do I mean? It's pretty straightforward. It is simply the injection of energy and momentum by stars. There's many ways that stars inject this energy and momentum, so I thought we should first go over what those different mechanisms are. So this is a list. Uh, the first is